Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the July 2021 edition of the St. Louis Java Users Group. The St. Louis Java Users Group is an informal organization of Java developers, as the name would imply. Attendance is free. There's no formal membership list. Normally, we meet on the second Thursday of every month except December when there is no meeting. Uh, there's just too much going on during the holidays for us to organize a meeting uh, in December. When we meet in person, you can join us for food and social at 6 p.m. and the meeting starts at 6.30. And when we do meet in person, we normally meet in the Object Computing Incorporated training room at 12,140 Woodcrest Executive Drive, Suite 310 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'd like to introduce you to the other members of the steering committee. So from left to right, we have Ted Doyle, Todd Zimmerman, Bruce Allspaw, that's me in the middle, Wei Chi Gao, and Kathy Zwang. We have an email address. If you just send an email to that javasigsc at ociweb.com email address, it will go to all of us on the steering committee. The St. Louis Java Users Group would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. So I'd like to thank Object Computing Incorporated. They've been here ever since day one when the, uh, they're our founding sponsor. We have Chafrog, which has been kind enough to sponsor the Zoom account that we're using to bring this presentation to you, as well as the meetup subscription fees. Now it's free for you to go to the Meetup website and RSVP for a meeting, but it does cost the group some money and Shafrog has been sponsoring those fees for us. If you're looking for a position, a good place to start would be through a, a couple more of our sponsors, Signature Consultants and Adaptive Solutions Group. They've been sponsoring the food when we meet in person and JetBrains, has also been sponsoring a JetBrain, two JetBrains licenses, which we will be raffling at the end of the meeting. And if you're watching the recording, sorry, you do have to be present to win. And Elastic has sponsored some gift cards and uh, Intertech has sponsored, they're a training company. They've sponsored the famous Screaming Flying Monkeys uh, coffee cups and some other giveaways. They're, they have good training available, by the way. If you go to their website uh, at, at Intertech, you'll see all the training that they make available. At the end of the presentation here, we'll also be raffling a couple of Manning eBooks of your choice from Manning. And on occasion, Pearson will sponsor some physical books, which we raffle. So thank you to all of our sponsors. We do have some announcements. The No Fluff, Just Stuff conference will be opening in St. Louis, also known as the Gateway Software Symposium, October 22nd through the 23rd, starting at 7.30 a.m. It'll be at the St. Louis Marriott West, 660 Maryville Center Drive in St. Louis, Missouri. Now you can attend that either in person or online. So there are two options, you can go either way. And so if you want the details, it's just, Go to the web at nofluffjuststuff.com slash St. Louis. One of our uh, sponsors, as I mentioned before, is Manning. And uh, they wanted us to point out that they have a Twitch channel so that you can watch a lot of presentations uh, that they have put together. If you just go to their twitch.tv slash search and the term is Manning Publications. So you can watch a lot of their uh, materials there. We have presentations coming up. So on August 12th, that'll be next month, we will be on the Quarkus World Tour. And it's called All Rock and Roll and Brig Drum Solos. You can find out more details about that on the uh, meetup.com website, but that'll be by Christopher Bolin of Red Hat, who will be doing that. Then on September 9th, Guess what? Java 17 is coming. Okay, and that's going to be a long-term support uh, version of Java. 
So we thought, well, that would be good to find out what's going to be happening in the latest LTS Java for long-term support. So Simon Ritter of Azul Systems will be telling us about what's coming up uh, with the next uh, version of Java. So if you want to keep up with our presentation schedule, just go to the meetup.com slash gateway jug website to uh, see the presentations uh, as the schedule is updated. And if you're interested in giving a presentation or becoming a jug sponsor, just send us an email to the steering committee at that same e email address that I mentioned before. That's javasigsc at ociweb.com. So that's pretty much my announcements here for tonight. So tonight we'll have Jennifer Reef to talk about uh, Neo4j, pouring coffee into the matrix. So what I'm going to do. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. So that should enable uh, Jennifer to share her screen and take over. Why don't you okay. take it away here, Jennifer? Yep. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> oh, let me, let me just click this little button right here. Multiple participants can share simultaneously. Now try. Okay. Ah, there we go. There you go. Okay, we're just going to share this. And you're looking good. Okay, fantastic. All right, so I have tried to keep my my screen pretty. I have a, a nice large monitor, so hopefully everybody's seeing it all right and it's it's nice and clear. So uh, do flag me down if, if that's not the case, especially when we get to the code portion. So uh, we're going to talk about building Java applications on Neo4j, which is a, a graph database. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, upcoming slides. Um, but I know we have somewhat of a, of a constrained time tonight, uh, but if you think of questions after the fact or want to ping me in a, a side channel um, or anything like that, or just continue discussion. I'm happy to answer questions or, or talk um, via email, Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, however you're most comfortable. I'm, I'm around, so feel free to, to reach out. A um, little bit of background on me. I'm a developer relations engineer at Neo4j, have been for a few years now. Um, I like learning, uh, which is good for this field, right? Um, and then I enjoy sharing what I've learned and how I've learned it and tips and tricks and, and things that can go wrong. Um, so I write blog posts um, or sometimes guides uh, and such through Neo4j. Um, and then I enjoy speaking at conferences or, or meetup groups, um, whether that's in person or online, it doesn't matter. Um, and I had a few um, kind of hobbies and things I enjoy doing. And I had this nice long list um, and I looked at it and I'm like, okay, all of these basically boil down to I'm a geek. So <laughs> pretty much uh, anything on the, on, on, on the, where it's uh, like Star Wars or, or movie music or anything like that. Um, it all just kind of boils down to, I like geeky stuff. So, all right, so let's dive into the, the good stuff then. What is graph? Um, this is kind of a, a formal definition of it. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll kind of explain this in, in uh, hopefully better, easier, more fun terms here coming up. Um, but basically graph is a set of discrete objects, each of which has some set of relationships with other objects. Uh, graph was formulated actually way back in the 1700s um, by a mathematician, scientist, inventor, etc., called Leonard Euler. Um, and it, he was trying to solve this problem of what we call the seven bridges of Konigsberg. And there were four land masses in Konigsberg, Prussia, connected by seven bridges, um, as you can kind of see in the diagram down there. And he was trying to solve the problem, can I cross every bridge once and come back to my starting point? Um, and actually, this problem is not solvable. Um, but his work in this area formulated uh, what we see on the right there as the foundations of the mathematical graph theory, which is used for graph technologies, graph databases today. So it's actually been around for quite a long time. Um, basically, graph technologies, graph databases really just show how data is connected. So like in our image here, we can see um, kind of people and maybe interests or technologies and companies kind of floating around there. And we're seeing relationships to how these entities are connected with one another. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, but this is one of the big key things that's that's influential and important about graphs is it really truly shows the connections in our data. 
So if you're familiar with other types of data stores, uh, just kind of compare and differentiate the two. Um, so relational database there in the upper left hand corner, we have our traditional uh, kind of categorical tables where we have employees and we want to see that the departments that the employees are working or con are connected to. Um, and we'll typically create this kind of associative entity or join table or lookup table in the middle there in order to uh, kind of join the two tables together and give us those keys for both. Where graph is really just breaking down that structure into individual pieces and saying this one specific person actually connects to these individual departments. Um, so again, breaking apart those structures into pieces and showing how each piece relates to one another. Same thing if you're familiar uh, with like key value stores or document databases, the key value store in the upper left hand corner, um, we have our key tied to a value, maybe other keys. And again, graph breaking that down into individual components and showing how they're connected to one another. And then the document database there in the lower left, uh, which you can see those nested substructures of, of sub documents and, and smaller components within the larger set, again, pulling those pieces out into almost like a tree hierarchy where you have individual components tied together uh, through relationships. So what does graph have to offer? What, what advantages does it give me? Really, the, the main key and power of graphs is that it adds context and meaning to your data set. So for instance, the person down there at the bottom in the middle, uh, Jennifer, uh, me, <laughs> Uh, has these relationships and these other entities that this person is connected to. And we can understand more about this person's network um, or what kind of surrounds this person with the relationships and the entities around. So for instance, Jennifer is friends with the person there at the top, Michael. Um, the is friends with relationship tells me a little bit more context about how these two people are connected. Maybe I work with this person, which I do. Uh, maybe I just met this person at coffee. Maybe I happen to uh, work in the same building as this person. Uh, maybe we carpool uh, to work, etc. There could be a variety of contexts and meanings there, but this is actually telling me, no, this person is friends with this other person and since a particular date. So I'm, I'm quantifying it. We've actually been friends for what's three, four years now, um, maybe some people longer, some people shorter. Um, so again, kind of giving you more valuable information. I work for a particular company. Again, I could contract, I could uh, just like the company or follow them on Twitter. Uh, but no, this tells me, no, I work for this particular company and I like a particular technology. Again, I could just work with this technology or I could study this technology, et cetera. Uh, but this is telling me and adding context about a little bit more about me, um, and, and kind of the world around me. So let's look at a few graph use cases, so ways that graphs can be used. Um, the big one that most people think of is social networking. So how people connect to other people. And this doesn't necessarily have to be a social media use case. Um, it could be um, how groups, uh, friend groups or enemy groups form at school um, or how coworkers tend to group together um, or maybe conferences you want to study, you know, how people kind of group and, and uh, meet and et cetera at conferences, et cetera. So it's just really looking at how people kind of form relationships or maybe disconnect their relationships from a group. Uh, this one is fraud detection. So looking at um, kind of the whole network uh, as a whole, different types of entities in there. So a person's bank accounts, um, their personal identifying information, their phone numbers, their addresses, the banks, their credit cards, et cetera, and trying to see if we can find abnormal patterns. Um, so maybe you have, uh, in this case, you can kind of see there's a, a social security number that's shared by multiple users. That's definitely a bad sign. Uh, but maybe there are other things that aren't quite as obvious like uh, maybe you have four or five different users who are using the same phone number but don't have the same address and they're passing around millions of dollars within you know days worth of time um, that also looks suspicious and other sorts of things that you can figure out that are abnormal patterns based on the network um, network and it operations this one is kind of cool because it's actually a physical graph as well as being put into kind of a virtual memory state in a database. Um, but this kind of can tell you where your devices are, how they're connected, uh, maybe where when um, impact analysis, so when cables might need replaced or when you might need to do device upgrades um, or other sorts of things like that. So again, a very real world applicable physical graph as well as being able to model that uh, in a data storage capacity too. 
Um, identity and access management. This one I actually find really cool because I think that identity and access management is extremely confusing and, and very difficult to trace sometimes. And by putting this into a graph database, you can really follow the path of how someone got access to what resource and why, and really trace that back to understand which individual pieces um, gave them the access. And then finally, where a lot of uh, graph technologies got their start is graph-based search. So how can I provide more meaningful recommendations or better search results uh, based on something, keywords that somebody entered into a search bar? So again, looking at the relationships in the network based on those search criteria to trying to provide better results. So uh, Neo4j likes to say that graphs are everywhere. I'm actually going to show a few use cases to kind of show how varied our use cases are. Um, and of course, there are more cropping up all over the place. Um, and that's why we, we like to tease graphs are everywhere, because it seems like you go out into the world, you talk to somebody about some random thing. It's like, oh, that's a graph <laughs> that works. So here's a few. Uh, first off is the internet. So these are actually pages linking to other pages. Um, and so you can kind of see that tight cluster there in the middle. Those are very influential are important or, or well-linked pages. Um, so the larger the, the node there, the circle, um, that means that you have a lot of links uh, coming into that page or a lot, those are important pages. Um, and the more relationships coming out, that means that page has a ton of links to other sources. Um, so again, you're finding this very tight network there in the middle of kind of influential or important pages um, and then kind of less or so as you kind of move out from that, that center circle. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, fraud detection, but this kind of makes it uh, pretty clear where you have multiple account holders sharing kind of vital pieces of information. And again, just trying to trace through the network and find things that are abnormal or patterns that don't normally exist in an, an average legitimate uh, kind of transaction. Uh, graphs are literally everywhere. Here's a few or a couple, I guess, that are a little bit more outside the scope of traditional business, I guess. Um, this is NASA space satellites, so kind of important to understand where your space satellites are sitting uh, outside of outside of Earth um, to make sure they don't collide or aren't hit by meteors or or you know lose uh, billions of dollars worth of, of tax dollars. Um, so this is one way you can model uh, your space satellites to kind of keep track of them uh, or maybe move them around, etc. And then last but not least uh, is the Game of Thrones family tree. Now this is kind of a fun, silly not business related uh, example. However, you, this kind of stuff is used in tracing genealogy, um, or maybe you would want to trace through personnel records at a company, um, etc. And so when Game of Thrones uh, started coming out as a TV series, um, people were kind of dumping this data into Neo4j from the books or from what little TV had already had already released. And they tried to predict uh, relationships or allies or enemies forming battles, who would die, who would end up on the Iron Throne, um, who would get married, the whole sorts. Um, so it was pretty interesting to kind of see this data and to try to see how people could try to make predictions based on connections uh, in, in families. Uh, which is which is kind of cool and applicable to other use cases, even though this one isn't directly business applicable. Okay, so if you've if you have heard of graph technologies before, you might have heard the term whiteboard friendliness. Um, what does this mean? <laughs> uh, basically, it means that it tries to map as closely as possible the way you would model your domain on a whiteboard um, to uh, how it's actually modeled inside the database. So. When you get a new domain, when you're dealing with a new project, I know at least I, um, when I worked for a, a financial company before, before Neo4j, um, I would go to the whiteboard and draw out my domain or draw out the process flow. Um, and this is, I think, what a lot of people tend to do. So if we're looking at a Venmo payment system, which is the data set we're going to use for when we build our application, this is kind of the data model that I've, I've sketched out. Um, so we have payments there in the center. We have users who send payments. Those payments are paid to other users. And then a payment is typically made using a specific type of application. So mobile app, desktop app, et cetera. Um, and so we can better understand how people are using and sending money back and forth uh, by understanding the application. So 
we put this data model down, we, we've drawn it out, and that's actually my handwritten data model. <laughs> and then we might formulate it and make it a little bit nicer, you know, to put to our teammates or, or our managers or, or business users, et cetera. So we have a user sends a payment that's paid to another user, and that payment is made using a specific application. Okay, that looks pretty much the same, just a lot neater. And then finally, this is what it looks like in the database. Now I did have to scale up the, the image, so that's why it looks a little grainy. Um, but this is actually how Neo4j stores the data in the database. Granted, this is a visualization of it, um, but you have memory pointers that point from your node uh, through a relationship to another node. And again, a memory pointer off to another relationship to another node. And Neo4j basically just chases memory pointers around the system. Um, and so that's how it, how it queries and, and follows these patterns. But notice then how very, very similar that the actual storage uh, kind of format is to what we drew in the beginning. In, in this particular case, it's exactly the same. Um, but it looks very much the same. So as you can imagine, this is very easy to translate and hand off to your business users or your managers or your C-level staff or your partners and say, this is what my data looks like or this is what the process looks like. Um, does this look acceptable? Does this look right? Does this, et cetera. Um, and so easy, easy for um, even those with different types of experiences from beginner to advanced um, can understand this model and can use it and, and apply it. So that is kind of everything behind the scenes of what whiteboard friendliness means and the things that Neo4j is, is trying to achieve uh, by going this route. So let's look at how we actually build a graph and put a graph together. Um, so graphs are made up of nodes, which if you're familiar with the mathematical terms, it's vertexes. Um, and these are just our objects, our entities. Uh, we like to think of them as nouns. So person, place, thing, object um, in your domain model. So in this case, we have graphs, we have Michael and Jennifer, we have Neo4j. These are our objects, these are our nodes. Then we can add relationships, which mathematical term is edges. And these are our connections. These add context for how uh, these entities are connected together. And you can add relationship types like likes or is friends with or works for that again, give that context and help you understand the, the data a little bit better. And then you can add labels. They are optional, but these are kind of node categories that help you kind of group nodes together. Um, and this, it, they are optional. However, I like to use them, one, for better understanding of my data, and two, uh, it can have some performance benefits uh, when you're querying. Um, but again, optional, uh, but it looks, <laughs> looks nicer. And as you, as you can see uh, with the technology, uh, you can also have more than one label. So you can group your nodes uh, with multiple labels, multiple categories that then you can section off when you run your queries uh, and pull just specific parts of the graph back. And then finally, uh, properties, which help you enrich the node or the relationship that you put them on. Um, you don't need to store null values. This is one thing that's different from a lot of other data stores, um, is that typically when you don't have something, you kind of put an empty or a null value in, in a lot of other data stores, just to kind of fill that blank, basically. Uh, but with Neo4j, if you don't have it, you just don't store it. Um, there's no, re to take, no reason to take up the space uh, if you don't have that data. So that is, that is one nice thing. Um, but you can see there we have our type of graphs. We have our names on our persons. We have the name of our company. And then we have a date on that is friends with relationship. So again, this helps us kind of understand and, and better hydrate this model. So uh, I would be remiss uh, if I talked about graphs and not talk a little bit about how we query them. Um, there are other ways to go about working with graph data, working with Neo4j, uh, but Cypher is probably one of the most common uh, out there. So I'll just do a really quick introduction of, of Cypher. Um, and I will have a couple of Cypher queries that we're going to look at uh, here when we, when we look at our application and our, our data. But just a quick overview then. So Cypher is basically SQL for graphs. It is functional and visual. Um, it's based on ASCII art, so it does look pretty. <laughs> you can see on the right-hand side there, we have kind of the visualization of A likes B, and then we have the Cypher query to look for A likes B, match A likes B there. Um, so again, it does look pretty, but don't be fooled. It is actually pretty powerful. Um, it's a declarative query languages, language. It focuses on what to retrieve, not how. So again, very SQL-esque uh, in its kind of um, goals and, and uh, things that it was meant to do. Uh, 
if we wanted to create this pattern in our database, so Jennifer works for Neo4j, the visualization up there, um, this is how, this is the Cypher query that we could use to write it. So the create keyword is basically like a SQL insert. And then we need to create two nodes and a relationship, right? So we have our two nodes here. Um, they're inside our parentheses and you bring the parentheses together and that creates a circle, which is exactly how the node is visualized. So again, very visual, very ASCII art. Um, but within that node, within the parentheses, we have our different components. So we have our labels with a preceding uh, colon there. So we have a person node, we have a company node, and then we have our properties there inside our curly braces. So these are basically just key value pairs. So we have a name of Jennifer, a company name of Neo4j, um, and that puts together our nodes for us. And then we have that works for relationship in the middle. And again, notice the syntax there with the brackets um, around the works for relationship type, the little arrow um, that looks very similar to the visualization. So again, uh, really focusing on kind of that ASCII art being very visual, easy to maintain, easy to read. Now we've created this in the database. What about if we wanted to retrieve this back out? Um, we could write this query. So match is kind of like a SQL select. Um, and then we know we have a person node with a name of Jennifer. We know there's a works for relationship um, from Jennifer's node, but maybe we don't know what exists on the other side of that. So Jennifer works for, we don't know who or what. So we're kind of just putting a variable of whom there in that, that node on the end and then return whom. So return all of the properties and, and information that we have about that node that exists on the other side of that relationship. Uh, and as we can see in the visualization, as we know from what we put into the database in the last slide, uh, it's going to return with Neo4j. Okay, so that was a really fast overview of Cypher. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, let me know. Um, but let's go ahead and now dive into our application bit. So there's a variety of ways you can write applications uh, with and for Neo4j. I'm gonna talk specifically about using the uh, Java driver, uh, which is a, an official driver. We have a lot of community drivers too. Um, and then also Spring Data Neo4j, which uses the Java driver at its, at its core. Um, there are a variety of other options. There's a list of our official drivers, Python, JavaScript, Go.net, plus Java. Um, we have a lot of community ones as well, things like Ruby, PHP, uh, and more. There's tons of them out there that are, that are maintained and supported uh, by fantastic community members. And then we have a lot of other Java frameworks that we work with too. Uh, we have some uh, guides and information out there on running with Quarkus and Helidon, Micronaut, and, and others as well. Um, I'm just focusing in on Java and Spring Data Neo4j for tonight. Uh, but just to let you know, there are plenty of other options if, if you have other preferences. Okay, so this is how Spring Data Neo4j is laid out. Uh, we have the Neo4j Java driver at the bottom left there. Uh, this is everything that SDN is founded upon. It uses the Java driver as part of it. And then SDN sits on top of that, uh, which allows you integration with Spring transactions. Um, and that will give you, SDN will give you the client, the template, and the Spring Data repositories kind of all bundled into one. Um, again, you can mix and match. You don't have to use SDN. You can use just the Spring Boot starter, which will give you Spring Boot and the Java driver. You could use just the plain Java driver and ignore Spring altogether, or you could use the entire stack, <laughs> which is what I'm going to show tonight. Um, but again, you can mix and match and, and take your preferences uh, however you like them. So. All right, so what does Spring Data give developers? Why, why use Spring Data? Um, it gives you a lot of variety for databases to connect to out of the box. So you've got a variety of relational with the Spring Data JPA project. You've got Spring Data Mongo for connecting to Mongo document database. Um, and it gives you consistency across those data sources. So if you're plugging, uh, unplugging from one database and plugging into another one, um, it's pretty easy to kind of transition across the board there. Um, it gives you out of the box repository, custom object mapping uh, that makes it pretty flexible, um, as well as a lot of things that just kind of come with it. Um, and there's dynamic query derivation, which we'll talk a little bit more about when I show the, the code. And there's um, domain specific language for custom queries, which I will also show. So this basically just means that it allows you to write the query syntax and the query language that typically goes with that database. So for Mongo, you can write SQL or you can write a JSON query, JSON syntax query. Um, for Neo4j, you can write Cypher. Um, for relational databases, typically it's, it's mostly SQL. Um, so there's lots of options there depending on the data source that you're dealing with, um, but it gives you a lot of things out of the box as well. 
So Spring Data Neo4j um, connects to Neo4j. I believe that Spring Data Neo4j is the only Spring Data project that connects to a graph database. I know we are for sure the first, because um, this was, I, I believe the project was initially formulated like 10 years ago um, in Neo4j's infancy. Um, so that's that's one one positive. It is still actively developed and supported by both Spring and Neo4j teams. Uh, we recently had a, a big release, and there's there's tons of new stuff out there around it. And this project is constantly being maintained and, and heavily supported for customers. Um, contains both imperative and reactive capabilities. The reactive capabilities were released uh, last year uh, with our new Spring Data Neo4j six. Um, so if you're not using that yet, we do now support uh, reactive as well as the uh, original imperative alongside that. So uh, why Spring, at least for tonight, um, makes it easy. Uh, those of you who might be familiar already with Spring, makes it easy for you to copy it. Um, Spring Initializer makes it pretty easy to kind of generate the, the skeleton, the scaffolding that I need to put my project together. Cuts down on a lot of my, my demo time tonight. Um, the reduction of boilerplate that Spring Boot has, again, cuts down on a lot of my, my development time, uh, especially a critical in a demo like this. Um, Annotation-based uh, OGM, which is Object Graph Mapper, for your plain old Java objects. This is super helpful. It does also cut down on, on some of the coding um, there, but uh, it just kind of maps your objects uh, straight to your graph for you. And then Spring Data has great connection to Neo4j. Uh, it provides both um, Bolt, HTTP, and then we also have embedded, which we don't typically recommend. We will kind of steer you away from the embedded, um, but it is still there. Uh, we typically go with our Bolt protocol as that's probably most performant uh, and the best solution there. So. All right, so this is where the documentation lives. Uh, you see the Spring logo up in the left-hand corner. They maintain, uh, well, they host it. Uh, if you look at the, the author box there under the Spring Data Neo4j, those are actually Neo4j employees uh, who, who have written that um, and maintain it, uh, but it is hosted under the Spring stuff. And then this is where the Spring Data Neo4j project lives. It is under the Spring Projects section of GitHub, um, but it's out there. And actually the last committer on there is a Neo4j uh, engineer <laughs> for that. Um, but you're welcome to submit issues or pull requests or uh, ping somebody, uh, committer or somebody out there um, and, and get some help. So feel free to reach out. All right, let's look at our demo. So I will kind of switch gears here and start with the spring initializer. And let me zoom this up a little bit. Okay, so we're just gonna go with a Maven project, the traditional Java language. I'm gonna keep a stable uh, release of Spring Boot, although I wouldn't have to since I'm not running anything in production. Um, artifact, I'm just gonna name this Venmo. Uh, Doug. And then I'm going to leave my jar packaging. Java 11 is fine. And then I need to add some dependencies. So I'm going to add web in here. And then also Neo4j. And this pulls down and basically puts together my palm for me um, and a couple other basic things. Open that up. Pull this in my other window. Okay, so I should be good with that. And now if I go over here, oh, I'm sorry. oops. There we go, <laughs> forgot one key. Okay, now if I just do open pom.xml, that should load IntelliJ for me. Come on, load, yay, okay. And while that is finishing uploading, I will go ahead and show, uh, if I can move that, yep, okay. All right, so I have a local uh, version uh, rendition of Neo4j running right now. Um, this is kind of our Neo4j desktop application. You can kind of manage uh, remote or local databases and I just have a local one running. Um, I do have all of the data for tonight. I'll have it in the repo and, and links out to it. Uh, no problems there. And I'll show some other ways you can host the data as well, but I'm just running it locally here. And if I pull up uh, the browser, we can take a quick look at the data. Close this. 
So I can do a, this is kind of our um, interface. You can write queries, you can explore the data, you can analyze the data from Neo4j browser. So this is the format that my data is sitting in right now. Notice again, it matches the data model that we looked at uh, beforehand. So we have users who send payments, those payments are paid to other users, and those payments are made to uh, using specific applications. So hopefully with that, I should now be good to go with IntelliJ. Everything looks like it loaded. Uh, let's just look at the palm really quickly. Um, so nothing different than what we specified in our spring initializer. Um, we're using the spring boot 2.5.2 version, which is a stable release using Java 11 right there. We have our Spring Boot Starter Data Neo4j. So that's our Spring Data Neo4j uh, dependency. And then we have the web dependency, which will allow me to create REST API and, and REST endpoints to access the data. And then test dependency and our Maven plugin that, that gets included in that as well. So nothing, nothing too crazy here. And then let's kind of open all this up. And this is just giving me the, the main uh, method here. Again, nothing too uh, inventive or creative there, just kind of the basics. Um, and I can, can add more to that later. So uh, let's start then. We know our data model. We have payments, we have users, we have applications. Let's go ahead and start kind of building this. So we're just going to create our payment class. And actually one more thing before <laughs> a little bit of housekeeping, I need to set up my database connection. So set up my credentials here and nothing's too secretive here. And again, local instance, nothing crazy, uh, but that should set up my connection then to the database. Okay, um, now, just like you would have uh, Spring Data Neo4j, you, our Spring Data JPA, you would specify it at entity, or with Spring Data Mongo, you would specify an at document. These are gonna be at nodes. So these are our entities. These are plain old Java objects in our class here. So. Now we can specify our ID. This is going to be our ID field. So private final string and payment ID. Um, and then let's go ahead and specify some of our other uh, fields that are going to be on there, uh, which on payments, we have uh, payment notes, we have a payment status, we have a payment action, we have a payment type. Um, We'll stop there for a second. I may have to double check those. And then we have a couple of zone date time. Um, we have a date created and a date complete for payments. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Let me bring this. No, I can't bring that back up. Never mind. Take a quick look at what else we have here. Action, note. Yeah, I think I got them all. How about that? Okay, now we can create our constructor and I'm just gonna grab all of our fields. So thank you, IntelliJ. And then I'm just gonna create some getters. So I'm not gonna do any setters tonight. Um, you can absolutely add them uh, just for simplicity and uh, not adding any additional complexity. We're just going to keep it there. So with that, let's go back and add in our uh, interface to go ahead and create our repository. So we have a payment repository. And all we should have to do here is we're going to extend the Neo4j repository, which gives us a few things uh, out of the box with Neo4j. It's kind of nice. So our object type of payment and then our ID type of string and this actually is all we need to provide. Um, I had mentioned that there were some derived methods that get included with uh, some of the spring stuff and things like find one, find all, find by ID. Um, those methods are automatically kind of uh, pulled and, and added for us with spring, available to us with spring. Um, so I don't need to write the code in the implementation because a lot of your domains are gonna write the same code over and over and over again. So spring just says, we'll take care of that implementation. We got it and it's just provided out of the box. So we're gonna take a look at how this works in just a second, but I need to create my controller first. So let's go ahead and do that. So create where I'm gonna have my REST endpoints. Um, REST controller and request mapping. I'm gonna add, make this payments. 
And then I need to inject my repository, private final element repo. Nope. Uh -huh. There we go. Do that first. Then I can create my variable. And then I need to inject that. And then create my my mapping for my endpoint. And I'm just going to use the generic slash payments mapping. Uh, not going to add anything special there. And find all points. Turn the payment repo dot and there's find all again I didn't have to define that method declare it anything like that that find all is just available and ready out of the box okay so with that in mind let's go ahead and build the project make sure all that works and let's run and hopefully the demo gods are in my favor uh, I found that today has not been super lucky for me. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Everything I've touched so far has seemed to like crash and burn. So, all right. Okay, so we should just be able to, oh, come on, focus, there it goes, okay. Oh, it's running a little slow. Come on, you can do it. HTTP, uh, localhost for 8080 slash, Yay. Okay. <laughs> so we have our payments coming back. We've got the actions. We have the date created and date complete. We have our notes, the payment IDs, the status, whether they're you know pending, maybe open, settled, and then the, the type. Um, so this last one here looks like somebody went surfing um, and, and that all looks good. And everything's been settled and cleaned up, but we can do better. We are dealing with a graph database, right? And right now we're just pulling payment entities. Anybody can do that from any data store. That's pretty simple. Um, so let's go back to IntelliJ and let's add a little bit more complexity onto here. So we're going to add our applications. So again, trying to, trying to keep it, you know, relatively narrow, nothing too crazy and, and complex just yet. And this is a node in our database. And then we'll go ahead and define our ID, private final application ID. And then let's go ahead and define some of our other fields. So we have a name, we have a description, and I believe we have a, an image URL. And that should be, I think, it. So let's go ahead and create our constructor with all the fields and then create our getters. All three fields and I think oh what doesn't it like did it not import this oh ha data type uh, and of course it didn't add it to the constructor application ID equals okay now hopefully and of course it didn't create that one either so let's go ahead and create the getter for that okay now we should be in business that's better now we could create our repository and our controller for querying the application endpoints and and getting our applications back but again we're dealing with a graph we're dealing with relationships why wouldn't we just start from our payment entity and connect to our applications from there. So that is exactly what we're going to do. We use an app relationship annotation. And if we recall, see if I can get back to uh, my data model. Nope, okay, one second. Not a big screen there, okay screen here. Okay, we go back to our data model. We have our payment is paid using a particular application. So we need to use this paid using for our type. So let's go back to IntelliJ. And we can use that relationship type there. And we know we're going to have a single application because you can't make a single payment from multiple applications, right? Um, so that's pretty straightforward, just a single one coming back. And then we'll go ahead and add a getter and just to keep things neat, I'm going to put it down here. 
like that. And that should be it. Should be all we need. Uh, so we'll wait for that to kick off again. So far, so good. Go back to my terminal window. And if I do the same thing over again, I should get my applications. Yes, okay. So we have our payments. Those, this is our, our surfing payment yet again. Um, and we now we have the application that's tied to it. So this person made the payment from their iPhone application. Now that's pretty good, but let's add more complexity onto this even more. Um, let's tack on our users. Let's figure out who made the payment and who they made it to. So let's go back to IntelliJ and we'll go back to our project window over here and we're going to add a new class called user. And again, this is a node in our database. And we're going to add an ID and private final string user ID. And then let's go ahead and add our other fields on here. So string, we're gonna, I know there's a display name out there. There's a first name on there. There's a last name on there. There's a profile pick URL, I believe. Uh, I think there's an about as well. I always forget that one. And then I know there's a zone date time for the date joined. Um, and then there's a couple of Booleans that actually ended up strings in my database. So I need to go back and fix that. <laughs> but there's an is group and is blocked. So we know uh, if the users are, are part of a group or are blocked. Okay, and then let's go ahead and add our constructor. All those. And then get back to not the easiest way to do that. Um, and then all of our getters, add those all in. So that creates all of them for me. Okay, that looks pretty good. That's our user. And now again, we could go through and create our repo and our controller to query from the user point of view. Um, but again, we wanna see all this from the payment side of things. So we can just tie in the relationships here. And we're going to use the, uh, it's paid to, uh, for the payment is paid to another user. And then uh, private, and again, you only have a single user um, that's being paid, which, okay, that might not be the case, but I actually did run a query to verify that was the case in my data set as well. <laughs> so there's no split payments going on uh, in this data set at least. Um, and that should be all we need there, but then, Remember that we also have a relationship to users who send payments. So we have something coming into the payments. Now, uh, one thing, which I'll go back and add in just a second. Uh, uh, let's see, paying user, we'll define it that way. Now, if you'll remember, if I go back to a uh, browser, you'll notice that this sends relationship is coming from the user to the payment. So it's actually incoming to payment. It's coming towards the payment. Um, so I actually can map that in my uh, class here where I have an incoming relationship. So it's coming in toward the payment from another user uh, class. So, all right. And then I need to create my getters for this. So getters. Okay, and that should be that. So now we should be able to rerun this. And again, this is all from the payment point of view. I could do all sorts of fancy stuff and create other endpoints um, for our users or for the applications, et cetera. Uh, but this kind of out of the box gives me kind of one place that I can actually access all of the data from a, a single endpoint. Um, because of the relationships that are in my system. So uh, now we have our payment uh, that's connected to an application. Again, we're using this, this Surfer one that's coming last year. It was made from an iPhone. Uh, this is the user that was paid, uh, Caprice Martinez. Um, and this is the person who paid them, uh, Morgan Allen, and all of the details about these two individual users. And of course, it is again settled. Now, I did mention earlier that you can write domain specific language, DSL, um, using Cypher to write queries for your, your domain. And let's look at that. So this gets us a good chunk of the data and that's actually retrieving about 40,000 entities coming back um, because you have your payments, which I think are about 9,900, 9, 10,000 that in my data set. Um, and then you have all of the 
the applications that are used to make the payments. And then you have two different users that are connected to, to those as well. So I think it's somewhere around 40-ish thousand entities that are coming back there. Um, but let's go over to our repository and let's create a custom method here. So this is all just using the, the out of the box find all, but we can specify something a little bit more specific. Um, and let's do, we're gonna have an iterable of payments. And let's say we want to find all of the pending payments in our system, because maybe we'd want to send an alert um, or notify, hey, these payments are still outstanding. We want to make sure we review these, or maybe you have somebody auditing or something like that. So let's do a find payments by, yeah, status works actually. Uh, and again, it'll kind of help you build these queries based on, on what you want. And it tries to do a lot of the mapping behind the scenes based on the query syntax or based on the method syntax that you've chosen. Um, but again, it doesn't always do a, a perfect job of that. So you can, you can kind of step in and take the reins on that. Okay, and let's just do something simple like that. Um, yeah, that looks good so far. So now we're going to do a match and we want to find payments. We want to find those that are pending, right? And then we know we have other types of relationships. We could return just the payments themselves or we could return the applications or we could return the users, but I'm actually just gonna go ahead and get anything that's connected to pending payments. So I'm gonna grab any relationship that exists out there and I'm just gonna say any other type of node. So no label specific or anything like that. Um, just grab any other type of node that's connected to a payment node uh, where our payment.status equals pending. And I'm going to return, this is gonna go off screen, one second, fix that, uh, return uh, P, and then we need to collect our others, uh, our other entities, I guess, and to make sure it condenses into a single row based on the payment, an individual payment, non-duplicated payment, um, so that we don't get multiple rows per payment uh, based on the number of patterns that exist. Okay. So with that, now we need to go back and pop into our controller and define one more endpoint in order to access this. So let's just say anything pending. And then we have, again, an iterable of payments potentially coming back, uh, multiples probably that are pending. Find pending payments. And then return payment repo dot find payments by status, which is the method we defined in our repository. So with that, we should be in good shape, hopefully. So far things have been going without a hitch. That's a, that's a good sign, hopefully. So slash payments, and then let's add our slash pending onto the end. And this again, should return anything that's just pending. Um, so. We see our status of pending, that's a good sign. We have our payment, we have the paying user, we have the paid user, notice that looks a little odd, it's null. Um, <laughs> and then our application, this was an Android, uh, but our paying user is there. So somebody paid somebody <laughs> from an Android phone. Um, and again, same thing here, this is kind of odd. Um, so actually I went out to my database and looked at this so I wanted to match, and I just basically ran the exact same query. Well, other where p dot status ending. Why that does that? Return. Uh, I can just return star here. Uh, that should return all my entities, uh, and this looks very interesting. So I can kind of zoom out on this and it's, I know it's a little tricky to see, um, but I can, I can zoom in a little bit more um, and we can actually fix this view a little bit where we get, oh, that's not gonna show, okay. Um, but we have our users here in blue, our payments are in green, and then we have these applications in the middle and notice this one in the middle is the one that's kind of all wonky. So if we, Kind of scroll this out so we can see. I select this user in the middle. You can see that it looks like something in my data was bad <laughs> because it imported and it doesn't really have any data about anything. Um, looks like everything came in as empty strings, which is not great. Um, so that data import should be fixed 
on that front. But at least we know that our uh, query and our application is actually coming back accurately. It's just bad data. So <laughs> that will need cleaned out. Um, but again, we are seeing our pending payments uh, then coming back. And we've got the connected entities. We have the applications. We have the users that are getting paid. In this case, again, bad data. And we have the person who made the payment um, out there as well. So all the data at least is coming back. And it, it that part, that piece of it is working, even if our data is corrupt. So with that, let's jump back to our slides and wrap up uh, with a couple more things talking about uh, some other ways that you can deploy Neo4j. I used a local version of Neo4j tonight, but there's plenty of other ways you can go about this. Um, one option is running Neo4j in the cloud. And there's a, actually a few different options you can do this as well. Um, we have availability in Google Cloud Platform, AWS, and Microsoft Azure. You can run Neo4j on one of those cloud platforms. Um, but we also have now a Neo4j Aura, which is um, our database as a service. This was released at the end of 2019. Um, but it's entirely Neo4j managed, it's a database as a service, and the cost is capacity based. So you're paying for storage, IO, backup, and data transfer, uh, which is very common if you look at most uh, cloud databases uh, nowadays, uh, most of them are charging you based on capacity, um, which I guess makes sense. Um, we do have a few different tiers of Neo4j Aura. I'm going to kind of gloss over the professional and enterprise versions because I am super excited about the free tier, uh, which just got uh, went GA, uh, I guess, two or three weeks ago now. Um, so you can spin up a free instance of Neo4j, again, entirely managed by, by the company. Um, and there is no credit card. You don't really need anything except like your email address and your name <laughs> to get it started. Um, and so this is great, uh, small data set size, um, development projects, proof of concepts, um, things like that, all uh, really nice for this. Um, this is fantastic as a, a learning tool or just an intro type of thing. And then if you need more uh, business uh, kind of criteria and features, better SLAs uh, for running critical applications. You have both the Aura Professional and Aura Enterprise uh, options up there as well. I just wanted to point out the, the free tier and highlight that because uh, I'm super excited about that. Um, and I actually do have an Aura free tier instance up and running. It's just got another demo data set sitting in it right now. So <laughs> um, other ways, yet other ways to run Neo4j. You can run Docker instances. I showed you Neo4j desktop a little bit tonight. Uh, again, local application. You can connect remote to remote databases or local databases through that. It's just kind of a, a, a local application that you can use to manage different types of, of databases. Neo4j Sandbox is somewhat similar to Neo4j, the free tier of, of Aura, um, but it's just a temporary instance. So you get three to 10 days maximum um, of just kind of playing and, and small type data set ex exploration type of stuff. That's available straight out of our website if you, if you head out there. Um, and then you can run uh, local or uh, kind of physical uh, instances of Neo4j using the community or the enterprise server edition as well. So plenty of options out there. So everything that we've covered tonight, um, I have the source code for the application that I demoed um, out on GitHub. All of that is available there and I have a, a little bit of explanation. I believe I link to the data set. If not, I will verify that and make sure it's out there. Um, if you're interested in Spring Data Neo4j stuff, the documentation is, is uh, linked there, as well as if you wanna know more about Aura um, or if you're already using Aura and you want to give feedback, I don't know that the feedback link is, is super highlighted on our site. So I wanna make sure you guys have that as well. Feel free to post uh, bugs or feature requests or anything that you need there. Um, and if you're curious to learn more about Neo4j, brand new to this and, and kind of swamped with all the information I gave tonight, um, we're available on a ton of different platforms. So Discord and Discourse are kind of more of our forum, chat channels, question, answer type of sites. Uh, we do have a Twitch channel. Um, all of the Twitch videos get posted to YouTube after after the session ends. So if you go out to our YouTube channel, we've got a, a ton of stuff out there, a lot of live coding, kind of hacking at stuff. Uh, my team does a ton of that, uh, whether you're working with applications or drivers or building podcast apps or, or just data import uh, and query type of things, uh, that's all available there. And then of course, uh, the more official spaces, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and those sorts of things, you can find the Neo4j Twitter uh, accounts out there as well. Again, feel free to reach out to me 
if you think of something outside of tonight, I'm I'm going to stay stick around and take as many questions as you guys have. Um, but if you think of something later, don't hesitate to reach out to me. So with that, thank you guys very much, and I hope you have a good rest of your night. Hi Jennifer, I see we do have a few questions in the chat. Okay. Are you able to bring that up and answer those? Yes, I can. Go um, right ahead. I will turn my sharing off at least. Okay. Uh, where should you implement Neo4j or in what kind of applications should Neo4j have? Um, so, I mean, I've seen it implemented in a variety of ways, anything from business critical applications. Um, so as just a, a general instance, um, NASA uses us for their doc, uh, lessons learned database, which isn't, I, I gather, you know, business critical. Um, but they use that to plan all of their missions. Um, one of their, I believe it was one of their recent Apollo missions, um, they were able to find some previous parts that they had built back in the 80s or some odd that they can use as prototypes for new things. And they were able to save a lot of time and money um, using their lessons learned database in Neo4j. Um, that's one application we've, we've seen like transactions, things like bank fraud, people will dump live transactions um, into Neo4j and uh, run analysis or, or run their day-to-day -day kind of high availability transaction databases through Neo4j as well. Um, we do see a lot of um, analysis use cases, things like machine learning. We have a, a graph data science library that does a lot of heavy analysis and you can run that in real time as well um, and then have read replicas that can handle a lot of your, your analysis side of things. Um, it just, it, it really depends on the use case you're looking for. And mostly we really try to recommend things that are running slowly on certain systems might actually be a better fit for graph um, because it depends on if you're, if you're concerned or those relationships are really important. So uh, like bank fraud, understanding what is fraudulent and how these entities all connect to one another. That's not a use case that I think you can dump into a lot of other types of databases and get the results in real time. Uh, where in graph, um, even if you have millions upon billions of, of nodes and relationships, you're typically querying a portion of the graph at one time. So therefore you're cutting down on that indexing, you're cutting down on that query time and making the the performance really improve uh, for doing all those lookups and, and kind of those traditional joins, I guess, if you will. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. If, if not, feel free to, to add a follow up question in there. Um, but I've seen it across, you know, analysis stuff, real live transactions, uh, or, you know, impact analysis and planning strategizing type stuff, um, and, and all sorts all over the board. Um, so how would Neo4j handle a change of address and or name? Um, so you can run update queries. Um, there's lots of, of refactoring and things you can do. Um, a lot of the things you can, you can write Cypher for that. You can use a, an application or a driver, uh, a programming language driver in order to run uh, updates. Um, we also have uh, the APOC library, which is awesome procedures on Cypher. Um, it's kind of our utility library and it has an absolute ton of ways uh, procedures and functions that you can schedule batch jobs or run updates or refactor the whole database or all sorts of things. Um, so you can write update queries uh, to change the data. Um, it, it depends on your data model for exactly how you would change it. So you could have the address on a person node um, if something's you know, if you're not really, if you don't really care about the address specifically, um, but it, like in a bank fraud situation, uh, you might want to pull that address into a separate node so you could see the relationships of that same address to multiple people. Um, so in that case, if you have a separate entity, you would update that particular node in the database with a new, an updated property, you know, set X property to new address. Um, or if it's on the node itself, you would find the person that has that address, the old address, and then set that address property to the new one. Um, so, I mean, nothing, nothing too unusual, I guess. Um, but if there's if there's some nuance in there, you, you'd like to know, feel free to ask uh, more details. Um, can the edges contain data other than a label? Yes. 
um, you can have properties on relationships. So I think I did mention this briefly, but I, I probably skimmed it just a little bit, um, where I had the uh, Jennifer is friends with Michael since 2018. Um, you can add properties to your relationship. So quantify, okay, a person drives a car uh, since this date, um, or a person has owned this, you know, for a particular length of time, or, I mean, you don't have to put dates. That's just the, the one that automatically comes to mind. Um, but any type of, of properties that you want to store on the relationship, you can. And actually with our new 4.3 release, we now support relationship indexes, which makes lookups of relationship properties uh, much, much faster than what it was. <laughs> so uh, before we didn't uh, allow indexing on relationships. Uh, and now with our most recent release it came out, I think a couple weeks ago, we now do. Uh, so that makes searches on relationship properties really fast. So you can put properties on both relationships and nodes, uh, depending on your data model. Um, all the data has to fit in memory on one box. Yes. Um, so that was the case. Um, we now have uh, what we call uh, fabric, um, which now can kind of weave together um, different uh, kind of pieces all over the place. So um, you, can, you can take a, a little bit of the graph from over here and a little bit of the graph from over here on this physical instance and a little bit of the graph over there. And you can actually weave those together across shards um, to create a full graph if you need to. Um, so really large graphs and things like that if you need to dissect them. Um, we, I will say this, if it is not required, obviously because graphs are so interconnected, um, it's going to probably be, well, usually more performant on one box. However, if you just have massive amounts of data um, and it is going to cause performance problems, then by all means, we have the capability to shard and you can you can divvy out the graph and then kind of weave those back together using queries. Um, and that may make it performant if you if you have uh, those situations. Um, but I would I would kind of test it out both ways and see if you're really gaining performance by that. Uh, because again, your graph is probably very, very interconnected and splitting that up across boxes may may give you what you need and it may hurt you in other ways too so um it used to be that you, it had to fit all in one box but when we released fabric i think two or three versions ago uh that capability now you can divide the graph up if you need to okay uh where are there standards where there are standards for ansi sql i know there's a cipher query what standards exist um, so right now, uh, Cypher is, we have open Cypher uh, that is out there. So that, that's open source, uh, but Neo4j maintains uh, Cypher. However, uh, we, are, we are in talks with uh, a lot of partners, including um, Oracle with their graph query language. I believe some of the founders of Gremlin and, and others, other key players in the graph space are formulating a, a standard graph query language, which they're calling GQL. Um, and so those discussions for a, an official standard are coming out, um, but there really is no graph query language standard yet. Um, there's Cypher. Um, Cypher is a, is a major player, I would say, um, but you have Gremlin out there. You have, uh, I believe Oracle has a uh, query language. I'm trying to remember what they call theirs, um, <laughs> uh, PGQL or, or something similar. Um, but that's that's out there as well. So there there is no standardization yet, uh, but that's coming. They're working on a standard um, for SQL. There is DDL to define the structure of the schema. Is there an equivalent for Neo4j? Okay, so excellent question. Um, uh, Neo4j is schema free or schema optional. What this means is that you you don't define a rigid structure and force your data into that structure. Um, basically, you make business decisions about what you want your data to look like, and you can, by all means, put in um, constraints or um, uh, indexes or what is what is the one I'm trying to think of. <laughs> um, maybe it is just constraint. Um, but anyway, there's there's some boundaries that you can set for if I'm inserting this type of data, I want to make sure that these properties are exist exist, or I want to make sure that kind of this boundary is followed or this guide is followed. Um, however, outside of those, uh, we allow you to move and migrate that data model as your business needs change. So it, 
blessing and a curse, I guess, in both respects. Um, but I, I just do remember um, what I when I worked at my my financial company before Neo4j. Um, every time you'd have to go through a schema change for a relational table, it was an absolute nightmare. Um, so having something that's schema optional that's very flexible um, is is to me is a huge win. Um, absolutely, you will need to formulate business rules rules around that and try to add safeguards and things to try to protect that data and, and try to protect your models. Um, but uh, it allows you to be flexible and to change your business needs on the fly. Uh, yes, property graph query language, PGQL is correct. Thank you. <laughs> um, are they able to use this to track breaches after the fact? Yes. Um, so I have seen a few different use cases uh, where they have tracked down uh, things that uh, breaches or, or just trying to even plan for upcoming security hazards um, or, or gaps. Um, so security analysis, impact analysis, risk analysis, all of that stuff, you can use Neo4j uh, and dump the, the entities in and find where your, where your holes and your gaps are. Um, I'm trying to think, I believe there's one specific use case, if memory serves, um, where uh, they will take like your application classes um, and your applications that are throughout your, your company or your area division, et cetera, put those into Neo4j and figure out where you have overlaps, where you might have security holes in your applications um, and try to better plan and, and write better, more secure applications. So uh, yes, you can absolutely use it for that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of like fraud detection or security type stuff that that Neo4j is used to, to kind of track down and, and manage. So, and as far as the last comment, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I like this, I, I enjoy tech, I enjoy Neo4j, so I, I like sharing it, so. Okay, well, thank you very much and uh, for, the, for the presentation. I think that's all the questions here. Okay. So I guess we're ready to uh, do the raffle here. So I'm gonna stop the recording here.